It's all about authors this week on The Perspective with Mike Sherbineau and Julie Stoutland. A most welcome shout out to women of all faiths today, as so many of us are so hard on ourselves. This week, we feature author Denise Copeland, who talks about the liberating truth for women in Jesus. No apologies, no guilt, no compromise. Plus, author and musician Rick Kua is here with his wife, Diana, to talk about his latest book, What Are You Known For? Here's a hint, it's not for what you do or what you accumulate. Our prospective regular Dr. Andrew Blackwood talks forgiveness because we know forgivers live better. And the miracles of prayer with Dr. Gary Onick, who says prayer helped him heal from prostate cancer. And Matt Brown of Think Eternity with his latest thinking project. Now over to you two bookworms, Mike and Julie. Well, you know, as we're dealing with all these authors this week on The Perspective, we're glad that you've joined us and can be a part of the program. I think one of the things I'm wishing right now is that somebody would just write a simple little book on how all our politicians can get along, how we can bring unity in the country, and how we can work through the mask mandate, the vaccination mandate, and how everyone can live happily ever after. <laughs> well, today, uh, Julie is helping me again. And Julie, did you ever read those little books uh, when you were growing up that they all lived happily ever after? I love a happy ending. If you talk to my family, I don't like a movie if it doesn't have a Hollywood happy ending. <laughs> well, my wife says that's why she watches the Hallmark movies, and I want to make fun of it. You know how everybody gets married, uh, you know, an hour before Christmas Eve, and it always snows just then. Exactly. And then there's no more <laughs> snow. But uh, Happily Ever After is, I believe, a uh, code name for how we can walk in peace and how we can know what God wants for us as we journey through life and how to pick up the pieces. And you got an amazing guest today who's gonna to help us with that, isn't it? We absolutely do. Denise Copeland is with us talking about her book, Set Apart. Stay with us after the break. Denise, it's wonderful to have you on the show uh, with your book set apart. I want to jump in right away and say that, you know, there are so many times people feel like they're the only ones going through something. And I would love for you to share from that point a little bit about your own journey and how you discovered Christ in your life. Yes. Yeah, so we all are going through something and been through something. I definitely grew up in a broken home in Puerto Rico and didn't have, you know, the greatest family. Parents were divorced and was searching my whole life for who I was as a woman of God. What's my identity? Why am I here? What's my purpose? Um, and alongside that of me surrendering my life to Jesus at three o'clock in the morning in my car, I felt the tangible presence of God that drastically changed my life and just led me on a journey on finding who I was and what was I here for? You know, you share in your book how you never felt treasured or chosen. What would you say to someone who is watching today who feels like that right now? Yeah. So I will tell you that that is a lie. Um, it is a lie to believe that you're not treasured or loved because we do serve a God and there is a God that treasures you and loves you and cares for you like no one else has ever done before. And it's just taking that step of faith to really cry out to the God that created you to know that you are treasured and loved. You've always been since you were in your mother's womb. I, I know what it's like to feel that you've made it look good on the outside and inside yeah you're not feeling the same way. I, mm -hmm. with my own experience, tell us what was going through your mind at the time and how do you think we can help others? Yes. So a lot of times uh, just growing up, I would spend just money on myself and really, you know, I used to do my hair a lot and just dye my mm -hmm. hair, just make sure that my physical outward appearance was looking good. Because if I looked on the outside, people would think that I would look right in the inside, but it was completely I was deceiving myself and I was deceiving others. 
um, and to wearing this mask, this costume that everything is fun on the outside and I was broken on the inside. Um, yeah, it, it wasn't until really like Christ that just like came at me and really, how would I say it? Just softened my heart, just um, met me in my lowest point where I knew that I wasn't right on the inside. And that's where he wants to start the, the real work in us in the inside and then on the outside. Um, so I would say it is that, interesting yeah. how so often you hear we have to get to that lowest point before we realize that God's there waiting for us. And then he's waiting to, to heal us and saying, telling us to take that mask off. And just like what happened in your life, I think that's very interesting that you do hear that so often yeah. in your, in your book, you, you, you talk about the, the Mary Martha example. And I thought that was very interesting. How do you as a busy wife, mom, author, leader, <laughs> balance serving and resting? Well, it definitely is a challenge <laughs> because I I love doing things. I'm a multitasker. I've always like worked like two jobs. And mm -hmm. um, in the midst of that, I longed for rest as well. I feel like I have moments where I can be super busy and then I can be super restful. I can be both Mary and Martha. And I believe that as, you know, that we as women can be like that. There's, there's always these extremes, but I think there's a time where we can bring that balance where, okay, I'm doing all of this, but at the same time, I want to rest. So there's that invitation of working, but always like, I, always like looking at the posture of your heart, like what is driving you to do what you're doing? And then there's those moments of just rest or working from a place of rest and abiding in, in Jesus, which changes everything. Um, yeah, I have a lot of little ones, so it's hard to balance that out, but I do find those quiet moments in my soul where I can be like, okay, Lord, like I am just going to abide in you and I'm going to do this as best as, as I can from a place of rest because it's unto you and not unto the people around me. So that changes everything, having that perspective. It's true because it isn't something we're going to completely conquer and it's to yeah. the best of our ability that we try to focus on being restful in the midst of our busyness. And it is, like you said, it is taking those moments in the midst of whatever we're doing that God has us involved in, but always trying to refocus and walk in his rest. So we have his strength and not walking yes. in our own and burning out. Right. Amen. Yes. Women. I want to say women are, you know, often so hard on themselves. Uh, why do you think this is? Because we try to do it all. We want to do it all. We want to be it all for all the people. We want to serve our husbands. We want so to true. be there for our friends and be there for our kids. And the truth is we can't do it all. Like we're just human. We're just a person. And that is the reason why we need to draw from the strength of God and really abide in him because through him, we can do all things, right? Like when we're operating in and through him, but on ourselves in our weeks, you know, we, we are, we can only, we're limited. We're limited, but we serve an unlimited God. And so when we connect to him and we abide in him, then things, this is something I have to practice every day. Like I am not like, Oh, I did this. I, I just, I don't struggle with this. Like this is a challenge for me every day when I wake up and, but I take on the challenge. Like, <laughs> and, I, and I think that's the point. I think all of us need to take on that challenge every single day. And that's a part of us choosing to grow every yeah. single day because we never completely arrive. We're always in a state of learning. We have a minute left, but I'd like to ask you, how was the process of writing your book set apart? Wow. It was very interesting. I never <laughs> thought I'd write a book, um, especially in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, we had all of our kids in the house and we really had to work through schedules and all of that. So we created a plan as, of course, as a busy mom, like you never get time to yourself. Like it's very rare unless you're in the bathroom and you're locking all <laughs> <laughs> locks and everything. But, um, we, I really, we really made it happen. My husband and I just working as a team and he, we created this schedule where, you know, this certain amount of time will be blocked off for Denise to go and write. So it was like two hours a day where, I would just sit and write and type. And that really helped me write the process of the book. But it was a beautiful journey. Uh, also painful because you have to look back like, you know, through your past and really right. relive those moments. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but 
overall, uh, it was it was a journey that I would do it all over again. So, yeah. That's great to hear. We'll stay with us, Denise. I know that Mike wants to come back after the break with his own questions. Stay with us. A life-altering disability, infidelity, and trapped in a prison of fear. Those were only a few of my giants. What are yours? People see a happy marriage, a crown, a title as Miss Wheelchair Canada, but not understand the giants I've battled. I know what it is to be consumed with fear and struggling to find hope. How easy do you think it was for me to walk through infidelity with my husband? Once I started fighting with God's strength, the battles that nearly destroyed me actually gave me this contagious courage that has unlocked a new level of joy and freedom I didn't know existed. Did you know that every giant you face is an opportunity for an even bigger victory? What giants are you facing right now? Today, I challenge you to look at the giants in your path through God's strength and power, not your own. Well, I'm really delighted that I can just have this time just to chat with you, Denise. And I got some questions to ask you because, uh, unfortunately, I realize that I'm probably old enough to be your dad. But what you also don't know is that I have five adult daughters. Okay? Wow. So, wow. wow. So, like, I've been thinking about what you're talking about. You talked about how you like to spend all the money on your hair. And I would have loved you to be my daughter because then I wouldn't have had to pay for so much hair. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I've gone broke on that one. But um, let me ask you these questions as, as you juggle life, because people watching today are trying to figure out, how do I hold it all together? How do I keep it all together? And we admire you because you're an author and uh, you and your husband are very busy in ministry. You got kids and somehow you do the laundry and, and your hair is curled. It looks beautiful. But um, how do you find rhythm in life? Give us some practical things about what you do to find rhythm. Yeah, so rhythm for us is really important. It's important for me um, just because there's so much happening around me. Um, something that we really implement is having a schedule, a set schedule, but also in the midst of that schedule, we take a Sabbath day. We take a day where we rest and we truly wow. do a day where I don't know what day that is for anybody else, but we take a day where we don't touch the laundry. We don't touch the dishes. We don't, I mean, we, we cook or whatever we have to do, but we don't, I don't do the major task things like, Oh, I have to do laundry. Like I'm not a slave to like, I have to do this, this day, you know, I have to do all things. And so that has caused us to like pause and reflect and really rest and spend time with the the family, be present. Um, I really believe that resting and taking that day off has really done a huge impact on our on our life. So just briefly, did it take you a while to arrive at that point saying, hey, we got to do something or we're going to come unglued? Yeah, it took me a while. Actually, it, it wasn't until we started having children that I realized that I needed rest. And if anybody out there has children, you know, you need the rest. Like, especially when you got four or three children just running around toddlers, you need that rest. And it really forced me to do that. We're not perfect at it. We've It's a journey that we've been learning of like, what, you know, what that, what does that look like for our family? But the day, the times that we've done it, like it's really brought a lot of rest, like not just like physical, but soul rest. So we're able to worship together or just like go out in nature and just really connect with God. And wow, it has really helped recharge us and get ready for the week ahead. So let me, let me ask a different question that I get asked as a man a lot, but in the context of a, of a dad who has five daughters, I want to ask you, how do you define success? Like at the end of each week, if you were to look back, how would you know if it was a successful week? And maybe success is not the right word, but I'm going to use it. Okay. So for me personally, success looks really different for me. And what I believe that to be is that I have loved my children and my spouse well. Um, I'm a person that I... I I like to do it all and get things done, but that's not my main focus of why I'm doing the things that I do. Um, so success to me is that I really, you know, lived through a week where I poured into my children um, and I basically like walked in the way that honors on other people and the Lord. Um, yeah, that's my focus really genuinely. I like to hear that. You know, we yeah. live in a world um, where there's this 
constant argument about women versus men and men versus women. I think, you know what, I think the reality of that question is something that we struggle with. And as a father, I've really struggled with helping my own daughters mark their own way because oftentimes things get superimposed upon them. Mm. And I am so impressed with how you have found your own niche and how you've pushed through. And I just was thinking maybe there's a, a little nugget that you can share with us, like what's helped to keep you rising above it when it's so easy for people to put us down and, and bring us down to the lowest common denominator. That's kind of where I was going. Okay. So I would say really just knowing who you are, knowing who you are in Christ, because the world will want you to be all these other things and people will speak into your life and say, you need to be doing this or you need to be doing that. And they portray this image of like what you should be doing or not doing. And so really knowing who you are and your identity, which is found in Jesus really changes everything. Um, It changes your perspective on your calling first. Like it's like, you know, your calling, like the calling that God has placed over your life. Um, And so that enables you to walk out exactly what, you know, you've been called to do. Um, without comparing yourself to other people, right? Because there's that comparison game and you want to do what she's doing or and or what he's doing. And then all of that causes distractions and you're not focused on your first calling, what you're called to do. So, right. yeah, I would say just really knowing who you are in Christ and your identity. That's really insightful. I'm going to invite Julian in the conversation for the last minute because we've uh, talked about this issue before together. And uh, Julie, what, what's your question for Denise as we're processing what she's been sharing? Well, you know, Denise, I've had the wonderful opportunity to interview your husband, Rashan, twice now, and it's been a great blessing. So I wanted to ask you, with how does he help or hinder you along with your family and your ministry? How does he how does he walk beside you? So um, that looks like really helping me with our children, really. <laughs> like that is really our major thing. And it's really being present and um, and walking with me and, and raise our children. Um, we join a lot in different ministry things. It doesn't always look the same because he's so busy and he's like Mm -hmm. so it has all these different opportunities which is so different for me but he we we were able to like come alongside each other and really help one another in the home and even having community in our homes and you know opening our homes to to people and so that's that's a way that he's really helped me and pouring into me reading the word of God over me, praying for me has been major key because I cannot raise like these children by myself while he's gone doing, you know, the Lord's work. So prayer and really encouraging me has been vital for us. Well, you know, Denise, it's wonderful to see that you and Rashan are a great team, that you're working for the Lord and you, you are impacting people's lives. So thank you so much for being with us today. It's been a wonderful blessing to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm humbled. Stay with us. We'll be right back with Mike's Word. You are so much more than what you do, what you achieve, what you feel like. We want you to know there is so much more about you. And you are not defined by a goal, a win, or the position you hold. We want you to know you are more complex, more unique, and more significant than any gold, silver, or bronze. You, you are the total athlete. What is the total athlete? Faith, life, and sport. We're continuing on today in Psalm 23, the journey to Graceland. And if you think about the phrase Graceland, we want to go to a place where we know we're welcomed, where we know it's safe, where we know that we belong. Those things are key in our life. The idea of the word grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. And that not only is salvation as we trust Jesus to be our savior, the forgiveness of sins, but the security that comes from knowing that we are loved by God. Many times we hear the phrase, and we heard it in one of the interviews today, of 
knowing who we are in Christ, our identity. You see, when stuff happens in our life, it destroys our identity. It, it shapes us. It's like being in a car wreck. I remember once um, a friend of mine let me drive his Porsche, and it was a fun machine to drive, but he'd got it at a fraction of the price of what it was worth because it had been in an accident, and they had to straighten the frame out, and as a result, it lost so much value. That's a lot like our lives. Because of what has happened to us, we think that we have lost our value. And in many ways, it is true until we meet the Good Shepherd. And you see, the Good Shepherd is none other than the Lord himself. David, who was the giant killer, David, who was the king of Israel, he comes and he writes this beautiful psalm where he says, the Lord is my shepherd. He uses that wording, I believe, simply because David was a shepherd as well. He knew what it meant to care for the sheep. He knew what it was like to have a sheep wander away. Maybe that's why Jesus, who is described as the good shepherd, talks about the shepherd who leaves the 99 in the pen and goes after the one who has wandered away. Sometimes we wander away because of the wreck we have been in, the pain that has, been happen that has happened to us. And we say, there's no place. I can't ever come back. But that's not true. That's a lie that Satan wants to whisper in our hearts. And sometimes it's more than a whisper. He yells it. And what is it that you're listening to today? Because the scripture tells us that God is able to restore our soul. He's able to bring it back to its original intent. He's able not just to, strength, to straighten out the frame that has been wrecked in the crash, but he's able to do it in a way that it is better than it ever was before. God is able to turn trash cans into trophies. He wants to do that with your life and my life. And how is it that he restores our soul? Well, oftentimes it's by confronting us, but with tenderness. And God perhaps today is confronting you and saying, my son or my daughter, you've been wandering from me. I want to invite you to come back. Jeremiah wrote this in Jeremiah 3, verse 22. The Lord is saying, my wayward children, says the Lord, come back to me and I will heal your wayward hearts. What an incredible invitation. He's saying, come back, come back right now. And I think that another way that God restores our soul is not only by allowing us to hear his words where he says, come back, because it is so good to feel wanted, but he allows us to see the love that he had for us, the love of the Savior in a fresh way. Do you remember when Peter had blown it? Peter was the disciple who denied Jesus. And it says that when he denied him at that moment, the Lord turned, we read, and he looked at Peter and then Peter remembered what the Lord had said. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you'll deny me three times. And Peter left and he wept bitterly. What he saw, though, in his Savior, the one who he had denied, was someone in the look. It wasn't a look of condemnation, but it was a look that was inviting Peter to come back. Peter didn't feel worthy. And yet, after Jesus rose again, what was the message that he wanted the disciples to know? He said, tell Peter that I have risen. Tell Peter. Why? Because he wanted Peter to know that there was still the hope of that relationship. And Jesus did what was necessary to restore it. I find that sometimes God brings restoration in our life through the words of a friend. Has a friend been speaking to you and you've not wanted to listen? You know, James says, if anyone wanders from the truth, it says that you can be sure that the one who goes and speaks truth to that wandering person is going to restore them and bring them back. God wants to bring you back today, and he restores us so that we can come into new depths of relationship with him today. We can't outrun the grace of God. Welcome to Graceland today. Welcome to the fact that God wants to restore your soul and mine. You're saying, is it possible? I'd like you to pray with me right now. A simple prayer where God can restore your soul. You can just say, Lord Jesus, I know that I've sinned. I know that I've walked from you, but I'm asking you today, right now, 
to be my savior, to restore my soul, to straighten out my life, to make it what you always intended it to be. And if you've prayed that simple prayer with me today, can I invite you to write to me? You can just write to the perspective. You can see it there at the bottom of the screen. We have information we'd like to send to you. We want to encourage you in this journey called life. You know, Mike, as you were talking about your example with the car that had been through an accident, it made me think of how I've heard, and I'm sure many other people have heard, about the fact that you can have a dollar bill and it doesn't matter how wrinkled it is, how dirty it is, it's still worth a dollar bill. And I know when that was first shared to me in my life, it was like a light bulb went off because I felt like damaged goods for so long. And God looks at us that way. It doesn't matter what we've gone through. He still sees our value. I think that's so impacting and something we really need to get a hold of. You know, Julie, as you use that phrase, damaged goods, I get that phrase and we're all broken people. One of my hopes maybe for just today, right now, is that people will stop going down that road when they've heard you say those words and say, hey, you know, it's time that I get into the body shop. I need to let God realign me and straighten me up because the things in our past can often just warp us and shape us in a negative way. And until we go back and deal with this stuff, we will not be able to walk in what God wants us to discover and who he wants us to be. What are your thoughts? You're absolutely, you're absolutely right. It's so true that we need to realize we need to let God do that, straighten us out. And it is possible for God to use us from that point forward, no matter what has happened behind us. Today is a new day and we have to grasp that. His mercies are new every morning. It's true. It's true for me. It's true for you. It's true for everyone. If we can only grab a hold of it in our hearts. And you know, as you were talking about how his mercies are new every morning, we've been talking about the journey to Graceland. And grace is God giving us what we don't deserve, which is salvation. It's a new beginning. But his mercy is God holding back what we do deserve, which is judgment and separation from him. And he wants us to walk with him because the exciting scripture that's going through my mind is what we read in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. It says, if any person is in Jesus, they are a new creation. The old has passed, the new has come. Step into the newness. Let God restore your soul today. Discover what it truly means to be his son, to be his daughter. Mm -hmm.